testing, recording, and free to start. All right, welcome and thank you everyone for joining us today to explore how you can contribute to reconciliation. I wanted to expand, extend my gratitude to Kimberly and Mary Lee because I'm so thankful to be working with you guys again on this webinar. My name is Ali. I am mainly of Irish and French uh, descent. I'm a program manager with Health Standards Organization and I work with two uh, Indigenous-led technical committees, including um, the BC Cultural Safety and Humility Technical Committee um, for standards development. Before we get into our presentation, I wanted to acknowledge the land uh, where I'm located here in Ottawa, um, where I live, work, and play, which is unceded traditional Algonquin and Anishinaabe territories. It's also important to recognize that we're gathered here across Canada and acknowledge all the many First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples who have uh, marked these lands for centuries. So please take a moment to reflect on your location. We not only honor those who have come before us, but also those who will come after. So apologies throughout this uh, webinar if I'm panting, but I'm quite pregnant and now I'm also nervous. So before we kick things off, I wanted to point you guys all to the uh, chat box. And um, you're invited to engage um, in the chat box and to share resources and some practices that you guys are all um, implementing with regards to reconciliation throughout the session. So now I would like to hand it over uh, to Kimberly. If you could go to the next slide, we're gonna introduce the panelists and Kimberly can do her opening and land acknowledgement as well. Next slide, please. Should I just go ahead and start maybe? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Hi everybody, I'm uh, Kimberly Fairman. Uh, I am, first of all, a sister and a daughter, um, a mother and a grandmother. Um, these are roles that are really important to me and a big part of who I am. Um, I have um, uh, also uh, work that I do. And so I'm currently the executive director at the Institute for Circumpolar Health Research here in Yellowknife in the Northwest Territories. Yellowknife is the traditional territory of the Yellowknife's Dene First Nation, as well as the Norris Lake Métis. I myself am uh, Nunavut Mute, so I'm from Nunavut. Uh, I have lived and worked in Yellowknife for a number of years, and I want to, um, you know, I'm just so thankful for uh, my brothers and sisters here in Yellowknife who share their land and their teachings with me. And uh, I'm really happy to be here with everyone today and I'm looking forward to the conversation. All right, Mary Lee. Take myself off mute, that might really help. Thank you, Alyssa, and thank you, Kimberly. I'd like to acknowledge that I am also on the Anishinaabe Algonquin Territory. I am originally from Thunder Bay, from Fort William First Nation. I am an Eagle Clan and I am Ojibwe. I'd like to call on our ancestors who have brought us to be part of this journey with you here today. And I'd like to recognize the First Nations, Métis and Inuit people to whom have shared their journeys so that we can be part of the teaching that we are bringing for you here today. Please also recognize that there may be those that who are suffering right now on their communities. Keep them in your mind. Allow us to have good thoughts. Allow us to hear good things and allow us to speak and learn from one another. On all behalf of my relations, Jimmy Gwetch. Thank you, Alyssa. Looking forward to this part two. <laughs> Thanks guys. I already um, introduced myself briefly, but in terms of background, I was just gonna share that um, I work with standards team, uh, developing standards and my background in terms of um, professionally is I'm a registered nurse, uh, worked in critical care, primary health care and public health. And now I have um, um, the, the, the luck to work with HSO and to work with um, partners such as yourselves. 
So we're having a couple technical difficulties in terms of uh, moving the slides along with the presentation, but we're gonna keep going as is. Um, and uh, eventually, hopefully it'll all work out. Um, but um, before we begin, we wanted to just um, remind you all of uh, the first webinar that we did a few months ago, which was all about um, engaging with First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples. Um, and so if you haven't seen it, it's available on the CCHL and HSO uh, websites. A couple takeaway messages from that session were really about, um, you know, people building a sense of accountability and responsibility when it comes to building relationships and engaging with First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples. Um, and to build that sense of responsibility with regards to reconciliation. Um, the other main takeaway was really that um, you have to have that constant willingness to check in, uh, to check yourself and to self-reflect because it is an ongoing uh, journey. So um, just like session one, we wanna make sure that this is a safe space where people can feel like they can ask questions and um, comment on the things that we're talking about. I know speaking from my experience, um, I've always had this tremendous fear of cultural faux pas and I know I'm not alone in that. Um, so uh, please feel free to ask questions. We want this to be an open uh, discussion, open forum. So in terms of the objectives for today, um, we're gonna be reflecting on what reconciliation means to you. We're gonna be reviewing the seven health related uh, Truth and Reconciliation Commission calls to action, which are numbers 18 to 24. And we're also gonna explore how you can put um, these calls to action into practice, whether that be personally uh, within your organization or within your jurisdiction. So if we can go to the next slide, please. So I wanted to uh, ask, Mary Lee to please um, kind of introduce the current environment um, when we talk about reconciliation here um, amongst ourselves and within Canada. <clears throat> Thanks a lot, Alyssa. Thank you to everybody who's joining us. And I'm really glad to see that a lot of people are recognizing the territory that they come from. And when we ask you to recognize the territory that you are coming from, it's to recognize those indigenous people who may be near to your home or near where you work, the land in which you work in. So if you're, I see that we have uh, uh, Cynthia who is in the Mi'kmaq territories. And I wanna say Walalan, thank you very much for being with us. In part two, as, as Alyssa has already mentioned, <coughs> we're looking at this particular webinar as part of the harvest season. So this is a time to be collecting, looking at how you're going to prepare yourself for the long winter months, well, what seem long, the winter months that are going to be ahead of us, the things that we will have to learn from one another and the coping mechanisms that we will have to put in place in order to deal with our environment. A lot of people are worried about food and safety security at this time, and that mentally we're exhausted from all of this COVID situation. And I know that if we stay together and we stay united in these discussions, then we will see the light at the end of the tunnel. We keep on hearing, be six feet away from each other. We'll get through this. There, there is time for us to be able to gear up on what we are dealing with. We are now moving into the Christmas season. And we're now, of course, like many others are listening to media and the impacts that that environment is going to have on our own lives, the lives of our colleagues and the lives of our family. When we selected the theme of the harvest season, we looked at this as not only harvesting, but how we were going to look at the information that we would harvest. As Alyssa has already mentioned, we have the benefit of seven components in the Truth and Reconciliation Calls to Actions, number 18 to 24. So what we thought here would be a nice little exercise for everybody is to give you a basis for which this discussion could be built upon. Coincidentally, the fact that there are seven components is very parallel to the seven teachings, the seven generations. I am the second generation, 
my grandchildren are the third generation. So there are still four more generations to which I am preparing a path for reflection, to build on reconciliation, and to understanding the truth. So when we looked at this, we, did, we decided to build a pantry. And in front of you, you will see that we've built some, a very basic shelf. And what we discussed at the time was these are the basic elements of what a pantry could look like, what it would be stocked with in an Indigenous home. Flour, sugar, beans, oil, um, and that could be anything you know, like Crisco oil, tender flake, that kind of stuff. Corn, tea, and some herbs and spices, or some vegetables, which you may have been able to harvest by this point. Those are the very basic elements to which we as Indigenous people need in order to survive and, and sustain the hardship of our winter seasons. What we thought here was also the idea that you could take some of those seven uh, components within the TRC's calls to action and how you might be able to place them within your workplace environment. What would be the basis of it? Where would you put some of those components? How could you blend them together? What does it mean to you? This is a fight or flight time. The reconciliation exercise is not one for Indigenous people. It is one for our settler partners, like, your, like many of you on this webinar. We are here, Indigenous people, to ensuring and accompanying you in the principles of engagement and to understand the protocols of respect when moving forward and understanding your current environment. What are the things that you need in order to work and to make your work much more easier, impactful, meaningful, authentic, and in the engagement of your Indigenous partners. We look forward to the discussion that will happen over the next 90 minutes in order to how we're going to separate some of those calls to actions. Allie? Thanks, Mary Lee. I'm just going to invite Kimberly maybe to comment a bit on uh, the environment and our, our pantry discussions that we had, which were pretty interesting, what to stock the pantry with. Yeah, well, I think, you know, the um, metaphor of the pantry is one that reminds me of the um, relationship uh, that you need to have with what's there and the familiarity. So, it, you know, there was a teaching that I had um, recently from an elder um, who was saying, you know, it's one thing to have knowledge of um, uh, things or practices, but without having um, the relationship to either the land or the people without having some deep connection there is a real um, risk that the knowledge can be misused so i think the other thing about the pantry that i really like and you know in terms of the metaphor is this idea that it's yours and you need to stock it with things that are familiar with you for you and then you need to know what's in there you know and it can't just be um you know if you go off and you have way more flour than you actually need to do uh you know what it is you want to do for a meal so it's this idea of being familiar with what's in there having a relationship and a connection to um, the knowledge and the information and feeling a responsibility to use that knowledge in a way that is respectful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks guys. I think my main takeaway from when we were prepping around the pantry and the discussion and, and collecting and um, building the pantry is that COVID is going to end. Um, but the truth and reconciliation work that we have to do is ongoing. It is that journey and it, and it has to be sustained. Um, and building that responsibility and accountability in yourself towards um, reconciliation. And I think also in terms of Mary Lee, when you talk about it being impactful and relevant is that the pantry really has to be built collectively. So the onus on non-Indigenous people to build the responsibility for reconciliation is definitely our own, but that 
when we're stocking a pantry, you have to be able to stock it together with um, First Nations, Inuit and Métis stakeholders together for it to really work. So um, we see there's a lot of chat going on um, in the chat box and a lot of land acknowledgements. We're gonna move on uh, to the next slide to talk a bit about the framework that we're using um, for the discussion. Uh, so we have this framework about tackling racism and achieving cultural safety and humility. It's a framework uh, that was developed by Margot Greenwood, who's at the National Collaborating Center for Aboriginal Health. Um, and she really talks about um, tackling racism and achieving cultural safety and humility from these three interconnected levels. So you have um, the structural level, which would be at the policy level. You have the systemic level, which is really at the organizational level. And then you have uh, the interpersonal or service delivery level, um, which is obviously about the individual. So as we're going through these uh, seven calls to action, um, we're gonna be talking about um, what changes can be made at these three levels. And so we're inviting also uh, the audience to really um, provide examples of uh, work that's being done around reconciliation at those three levels, whether it be personally or within your organization or maybe some policy changes that you're aware of. So we're gonna move on to the first call to action and really get into uh, the bulk of the presentation. Um, so we're gonna start our discussion and you can see the call to action is um, on the slide and we also have a couple questions uh, for the audience that you guys can reflect on as you're engaging throughout the session. Um, but we're gonna do a little bit of a different exercise with this call to action where we um, wanna reflect on what the call to action means to each of us in terms of Mary Lee, Kimberly, and myself. And it's to indicate that that self-reflective piece is really um, important in terms of what does it mean to you um, what do you think you're being asked to do? And it, the importance of also talking about it with your peers, your coworkers or family members or whoever that may be. So in terms of the current environment, um, you know, this call to action is talking about um, respecting and acknowledging um, the rights of indigenous peoples. Um, so I wanted to point out, I think right now is a really timely, um, for this call to action because we see, you know, through Indigenous Lives Matter and Black Lives Matter that there's a lot of uh, individuals' rights that are not being respected um, or upheld at all. So um, I wanted to hand it over to Kimberly to maybe talk a little bit about that current environment with respect to this call to action. Mm -hmm. Well, I think, um, you know, the um, the current situation in terms of Canadian government policies um, and then other jurisdictional policies is that it is very complicated. Um, I think what um, has started to happen is as people start to examine the policies that are um, impeding on their ability to respect the rights of Aboriginal people, it becomes a bit overwhelming. Um, I think you start to see the linkages between uh, different levels of government. You start to, you know, if you're doing a reflection and examination piece, you start to understand that um, the policies are just the base of where you want to uh, get to and rights are just the basics. And so, you know, what it really takes is a lot of um, belief in your own um, sort of um, personal ability to uh, move into that space and really start to build relationship and change uh, some of the ways that we uh, either develop policies or um, enforce and uphold them. I mean, you know, some of the examples that I can think about in terms of trying to address um, Aboriginal um, people's um, rights um, is uh, when you see a barrier the you know, uh, either through the international law or constitutional law, um, the fallback is um, unfortunately, in some cases not to offer a service at all um, because you can't align with the current government policies. Um, you know, 
I just think about maybe some examples in our own um, area where we've had this experiences with um, issues like mental health and addiction services. And even though in our region, we know it's a priority, um, it becomes very complicated to try to design an addiction service that aligns with an indigenous worldview. And particularly in the current context, what we, you know, how um, there is this sort of bio biomedical um, perspective around addictions. And then there are safety and um, safety regulations and uh, issues of risk and liability, you know, in terms of offering that treatment. I think that uh, start to create a very complex um, system to try to work through. And, um, you know, as I said, um, the tendency in some cases is to step back from that and uh, rather than, you know, try to change the current policies. Um, so, you know, having access to traditional care uh, becomes something that is, uh, it, uh, you know, inachievable and it um, prevents us from actually moving ahead in those areas that are a real priority for Indigenous people. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Carolyn. Um, there was a comment from someone in the panel that um, I'll maybe get Mary Lee to address, but someone wrote, I'm not familiar with specific rights for Indigenous peoples. I would assume they have the same right as anyone else in terms of receiving best possible care and having choices. So maybe Mary Lee, you want to comment on that and on also uh, what Kimberly was talking about. Thanks, Angelissa. Actually, Carolyn, I uh, thank you for that uh, comment that you've made about specific rights for Indigenous peoples. And that's why in number 18, and that's why we put the flower with it, because that's the foundation for how anything is going to be developed. Are we making bread? Are we making bannock? Are we making dumplings? What are we making here? And what, in or what do we need in order to facilitate the production of that whatever it, item it is that we're looking for? When we look at this particular call to action, we want to make sure that we have an understanding. And I invite you to go back and look at the first webinar uh, for, those of, for those of you who did not uh, participate in that one, because we had explained the differences between Aboriginal, Indigenous, First Nations, Inuit, and Métis. But in doing so, we had also discussed the particular policies, regulations, and legislative pieces that would be combined to looking at the uh, how, we're, how we view the direct results of what it is that we're dealing with today under Canadian government policy. So that is going to be things like the Canada Health Act. It is going to be things like the Constitution. It is going to be things like the, uh, the Indian Act. It is going to be our, our Indigenous treaties. It is going to be United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. It is going to be um, some of the new modern day treaties. And it is going to be some of the bilateral agreements that our national Indigenous organizations have developed to looking after their constituents in First Nations, Inuit, or Métis categories. While doing all of that, we also have to be cognizant of the fact that we have outstanding issues. For instance, the residential schools. So with the Indian residential school system, we've heard a lot from whom are now our elders and some have left us. We are now transitioning that, that claim or those discussions over to Indian day schools. And we're also transitioning some of that discussion and how it relates in the ability for Canada to be able to respond to the declarations on the rights of indigenous people. We as indigenous people never negotiated, we never gave up, and we never put on the table our treaties for them to be debated. They are and always will be a part of us. So I look to another uh, uh, issue that Carolyn has brought forward, making the assumption that we have equal access to health care and rights. Unfortunately, Karen, Carolyn, sorry, we do not. It is unfortunate that in a country as progressive, rich, flourishing as Canada, that we as Indigenous people do not have that same access. We have been afforded the entitlement and the eligibility towards it, but realistically, 
And I don't know if any of you have ever been to a, a northern or remote or an isolated community. Have you seen a hospital, a clinic, a drugstore, somewhere you can go for urgent care, a laboratory, a dentist office when you've gone there? Is that equal access? When people from those communities require health access, they have to leave their homes, their structures, their supports, in order to obtain the services that they are inherently eligible to receive. So then I look to Pam. Uh, Pam mentioned the uh, idea of access to traditional care and treatment. And I say to you, Pam, that would be very interesting. And it is something now that is being looked upon and that will be done through the cultural safety and humility spectrum. We're looking at how we're going to incorporate traditional approaches and the content and or treatment into practice. But of course, it had, that is going to impact on the scope of work, the practice of the profession and the healthcare workers that will be involved. We are also looking at ways to be able to integrate some of those ideas and that content into the current curriculum in the schools of nursing or the school or the faculties of medicine. And how we're going to do that? Just think of this way. It took us a long time to get to the 94 calls to action to the truth. Think of how long it's going to take us to get to reconciliation. When we look at some of these issues, we also want to take a look at what you know. What information do you need in order to make your work or the policies or regulations or legislation that you're developing meaningful to Indigenous people? Where does the medicine chest clause come from? Some of you may have heard that term, the medicine chest clause. And I recognize and I acknowledge the people in the Alberta territory, the treat and Alberta Saskatchewan territory treaties six, seven, and eight. Treaty six is actually the founder for the, for the medicine chest clause under the current Indian Act, which then stemmed itself into the policy development under the non-insured health benefits program which is now being delivered through Indigenous Services Canada. And there is a truckload, let's put it that way, of the policies or the directives that allow for Indigenous people to have access to healthcare services, treatment, and in some cases, allowing for an escort to accompany the person to their treatment plan, their surgical procedure, or whatever it may be. What we want to be able to do here is making sure that you have all the information that you are um, privileged to have access to and how we might be able to do that. And I'm, I'm also wanting to, I, I'm, I'm looking at uh, the, the chat screen at the same time, and I'm also wanting to, to address some of the uh, tripartite committees that have been developed around the country. I see that PEI has one. I know that there are some that have been done in Northern Quebec. There have been some that have been done in Manitoba, Alberta, and BC. For that, I think that we should also be, how do we maintain that pulse of the knowledge of these federal, provincial, territorial, and indigenous government uh, policies that will allow for healthcare access and equity for indigenous people? Unfortunately, and Ali has already mentioned it, is that we see that we have already been, what would, you, what would you say, we have already witnessed an injustice by one in our own healthcare professions. Somebody who took the privilege that they had to ridicule someone which ended up in a very unfortunate result. But at the same time, it widened the eyes and opened the eyes of Canadians to say, this is not right. This is unacceptable. What do we do to address this situation? How do we move forward with it? What action can you take as a settler to addressing the issues for healthcare access equity for Indigenous people? It should not be because of jurisdiction. It should not be because of money, and it should not be 
because of your ability to understand the procedures that you're going for. With that, we also are, are working in a difficult time when travel is going to become even more difficult. And that is why in this part two series, we're looking at some of the issues that are going to be a direct result of some of those hardships and those barriers and how we're going to be able to address uh, Indigenous healthcare equity. Thanks, Ellie. Thanks, Mary Lee. Um, I was going to comment on like the wording of the actual call to action, which is also being reflected in some of the chat, which is the reference to past policies. Um, some people in the chat, as well as the remark that I had made earlier, is that it isn't past policies, they're ongoing, there's new ones being developed. Um, and that, that co-creation aspect of collectively filling the pantry and collectively um, drafting policy, uh, you know, in terms of ensuring its relevance and that it's meeting needs is, is um, important to recognize because I don't, I think people, a lot of think that it's all in the past, that it's not currently happening. Um, Kimberly, I don't know if you wanted to comment on anything that Mary Lee was talking about before we move on to uh, call to action number 19, but I open it to you. Um, no, I think, um, yeah, we can move on. I'm just thinking about time and we'll probably get into more of the discussion. One of the things before we leave this one, Ellie, is um, uh, the Champlain e-referral team has looking at virtual care. <clears throat> and just for most of you who are, might be working within that flat platform, Virtual care is, is becoming more and more part of the norm. However, the access to broadband with connectivity issues is one that is, again, a challenge for uh, First Nations and Inuit communities that want to be able to utilize telehealth or some sort of a direct result that has virtual care as part of it. So at the same time, while we're looking at policy and regulatory or legislative impacts, we are also trying to look at the IT infrastructure that is uh, not our friend. So we are addressing it. Thank you. Allie? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. And I see some practical examples um, in the chat where people are talking about talking to local MPs um, to eliminate the funding disparities and things like that. So there are a lot of things that um, individuals can do and advocate. And we're gonna be including some of these uh, practical examples in a resource that we'll share um, after the webinar once we kind of um, collate all of the information from the chat and um, from this discussion. So we'll move on to call to action number 19, which is on the next slide. So calling on the federal government um, to identify and close gaps in health outcomes between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal communities and to publish annual progress reports. So we see some of these determinants of health um, that they're talking about in terms of closing the gaps. And um, I wanted to hand it over to Mary Lee to maybe comment on um, you know, what the call to action, how you interpret it and how those gaps can be closed or, or, or what you think in terms of what those indicators are. So thanks a lot, <clears throat> Ali. So one of the things that we're looking at here is of course, this is just a very partial list from the social determinants of health for which many of you are aware of. But these particular items will also be congruent to and be part of the development as we look at cultural safety and humility. <clears throat> One of the other challenges or a potential barrier that we see on some of these indicators is the lack of data or the data collection that is being uh, developed as part of how we're going to look at some of these progress reports and how we can track or trace the monitoring of it. What we do know is that in some of these cases, the situation has improved. We know that the, uh, the indicators for more for research and for education is now getting to the point where we're able to start developing some of the numbers. And I'd like to recognize an or the, some of the organizations that are instrumental in helping us collect some of that information. Um, so Ali has already mentioned one of them, the National Collaborating Center on Indigenous Health. The other one being the First Nations Institute on Governance. And that is an organization which is, is led by First Nations chiefs. So what we'll look at how regional health uh, information is being developed or how the indicators are being captured. 
Now, one of the things that people should be made aware of in looking at these particular issues on this call is the fact that how do you identify as an Indigenous person when you're seeking help under one of these particular examples, one of these indicators? You are not required to. It is beneficial for you to identify because we do know that you could have access to other eligible programs or services in assisting with your treatment or your treatment plan. What we also know is that a lot of people are hesitant for the fear of um, the lack of treatment or how they will be treated if they identify. We have heard too many times, especially in the media, the way that healthcare workers have played games with our lives. What we want to say here is that we as the people sitting on this side of the table, like myself and Kimberly, are organizations that are interested in putting forward uh, approaches, process, indicators, data collection, data stewardship on how we're going to be able to address these efforts with Indigenous communities, leadership, and the people. How we're going to be able to look at taking away those those gaps in being able to look at some of the, the birth rates, infant mortality, the morbidity rates, and how we can look at those and look in addressing some of the trends, current issues that Indigenous people are facing and how those are escalating and hopefully how we're going to be able to identify approaches to reducing that. When we look at it, we're also looking at some of the areas that will look at <clears throat> chronic disease or multiple chronic conditions where they're going to impact on other types of illnesses. We know that one of the, uh, and just put it out there, this is also uh, Diabetes Awareness Month. Um, so I also sit with Diabetes Canada on addressing a lot of these issues because they have cross uh, or intersectional um, uh, sorry, goals uh, reach out to that we want to be able to identify if somebody has diabetes, do they also have this? Do they, or what are they also dealing with? How are they dealing with it at the community? How are you addressing for care? How are you addressing proper eating when you don't have the money, you don't have the grocery stores, you don't have the access to fresh fruits and vegetables? So how are you able to address what's going to be some of the proper care products for uh, the Indigenous people and, and, and some of their indicators. Thank you. Um, Kimberly, I'm gonna pass it to you. And I know one thing that we talked about is which system are you strengthening? So I don't know if that was speaking to the relevance of these indicators, but I want to hear from you, your thoughts in terms of uh, closing these gaps and determinants of health. Yeah, sure. And I think I'll, I can just say quickly, um, you know, some of the things that we run into when we're working in Indigenous communities um, and talking about evaluation, it's not just in healthcare, but in, in other um, areas like health research, education, and that sort of thing, is how the indicators are developed and whether or not we're considering um, success from a community or an Indigenous perspective. Again, if you look at um, some of the ways that we measure success in the health system, they're very focused on um, um, biomedical ways of measuring health and wellness. And we know that in our communities, um, some of the indicators are much more relational based. They're much more about community or health of the land or access to um, clean water. I mean, the, and so I would just really encourage people um, when you're looking at measurable goals and when you're thinking about closing the gaps, um, we need to really consider Indigenous knowledge systems and ways of knowing and try to, I think, reinforce um, success based on those measures. Um, and I'm not sure, you know, when we talk about achieving goals, if we're not on the same page around what we're trying to do, um, you're already starting in sort of a deficit position. 
And so I think that would be my main message is, you know, again, understanding that the systems aren't always congruent and really trying to focus on strengthening or um, equalizing, you know, the starting point for some of these measures and then including measures that are important to Indigenous people. I mean, it would be like just sort of pulling somebody along if we're not invested and if we don't have a say in what it is we think demonstrates success. Uh, what are we working towards? I guess that would be the big question. And I think um, it's really worth uh, getting into those conversations. I think people would be very um, surprised at the depth of uh, understanding and the depth or the level of contribution that Indigenous people can make and actually the leadership that we can provide in terms of what is important, what does success look like. Um, so that would be um, my reflection there. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think, I think it's really um, uh, important really to emphasize that those measurements are not necessarily reflecting um, Indigenous ways of living and being or what the goals are or, you know, what are we measuring? And I know in the comment box, there's individuals talking about um, data governance. Um, so there's the CARE principles, um, C-A-R-E. I've never heard of those, but I'm usually here talking about uh, OCAP, which is that ownership, control, access, and possession. Um, for uh, First Nation data governance um, and making sure that the information, whether we're collecting it, um, we don't own it. It's the, it's the data of um, the Indigenous peoples who are providing that information. And we also spoke to, I think, having the right infrastructure to collect that information in the first place. M many times there isn't um, self-identification for Indigenous peoples, um, so you can't necessarily pair um, you know, a, a health, like a chronic uh, disease related item uh, with the individual's identity, but also how does that help um, address some of those issues. So we do have to move on to the next call to action. I don't know, Mary Lee, if there was some final thoughts on uh, this one that you wanted to share. But uh, I'm being strictly time kept over here. <laughs> that's okay. No, no, no. Uh, I just wanted to say to people that I, we would like for you to, if you, you know, if you would like to put into the chat or you'd like to put into the Q's and A's box, um, I do see some questions in the Q and A box also that we will be collecting these and we will be getting the answers back to you in regard in in uh, in the next few, several uh, days. Thank you very much. Thanks, Alex. Okay. All right. So moving on to number twenty. Uh, so in order to address the jurisdictional disputes concerning Aboriginal people who do not reside on reserve. Um, so I wanted to um, ask Kimberly to start with this one uh, because we did talk quite a bit about jurisdictional disputes and um, your um, experiences with that. Thanks, Sally. Yeah, I think... Um, uh, it came up in the chat a little bit earlier too about Jordan's principle and and you know we in the first uh, call we talked about access. Um, I just maybe I want to in this part just maybe put a bit more of a personal spin on things you know in terms of my own experience because I think it's one thing to think about access and think about um, you know, the fact that the services are available and that there have been um, legal ways to ensure that we um, um, get access. But, I, you know, in my experience um, and over many, many years of uh, trying to address these issues, it becomes just really um, frustrating. And the challenges faced when you are thinking about accessing care, even for some of the most basic things, um, is in itself a barrier. So if you're an individual, you know, like me, and I've experienced many um, different situations where, um, you know, you go for care or you go to ask questions or you go to find out where you should be going for services. And it feels like um, the onus is always on um, 
me to sort of figure out the system. And even when you're working in the system, I'm not sure that we always understand where um, people can go um, and what the rules are. You know, um, a recent example where, um, you know, for several months I was looking for just a, a, a basic dental care for uh, one of my children. And it, it really sounds like, you know, when it's, it's explained to you how you're supposed to be able to um, get access to support or get access to this care. Um, it sounds like it should work, but the reality is that as an individual trying to navigate that, it just becomes very frustrating and challenging. And it's not, it's not equity of care in the end. Um, and uh, you end up having to dig really deep um, to, um, you know, find ways to influence a system or even to get help. Um, and I think that's what, uh, you know, when we look at this call to action, um, on the surface, again, it sounds like it should be fairly logical. And uh, we know where the barriers are. And there are, you know, we know that people have rights. But when it comes right down to it as an Indigenous person trying to access care, um, there are a lot of jurisdictional issues and it really challenges individuals. Um, this, and it shouldn't, in my opinion, it shouldn't be that way. Um, others, you know, don't face those same challenges. And so I think, um, you know, my main point would be to ensure that when you're talking about different jurisdictions, I really think that there needs to be more collaboration between federal, territorial, First Nations, um, and even municipal level uh, policymakers to figure this out. You know, it shouldn't be, the onus shouldn't be on individuals to try and figure out a system that isn't working. And we've got all these stop gaps in place that really don't make it easier. It just gives you a, new, a couple of more options and offshoots, but you still have to do several more steps. And so I, I really feel that um, in this, if you're working in the system, if you're in different jurisdictions, you really need to develop those relationships, collaborate, do the work, you know, and figure out how this can be a little bit more um, streamlined and accessible. Mm -hmm. And I think like we've talked about, oh, there, there was someone in the um, panel or on the chat saying there's a real need for Jordan's principle. But I think what we've talked about as well is that like that's not really the solution because even when you get to that point like you've already frustrated all of your other avenues um and it's still being put on you to to you know access the service or to get it so yeah um, exactly like i've had that experience where you know it was recommended to me then to apply to jordan's principle but this is at the third and fourth stage of being denied you know and so you have to each time go in fill in a bunch of forms you get denied and then you have to go and do this next step and you get denied <laughs> and then and then yeah. somebody says oh well why don't you try this you know and at that point um it just feels uh, insurmountable and you you do feel alone actually and isolated so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mary Lee uh we're gonna move on in a couple minutes but did you have any final or anything thoughts that you wanted to add to Kimberly and the jurisdictional aspect of this call to action you bet I do. It's the mind-blowing one. This is it's the big the, one. This is the big one. This is the one that actually comes from the speech from the throne. And under this particular number 20, this is where we, are, we as Indigenous healthcare organizations, are going to start looking at the development of the distinctions-based legislation. So to addressing some of the questions that come from Valerie and Donald and Cece, it's a looking at how do you address those jurisdictional issues? How do you define who is who? We have been, we have, <clears throat> we have already aligned ourselves with with our communities and where we come from and with the jurisdictions. But for those people who don't understand the hoops and the jumps that you have to go through in order to access healthcare, 
the distinctions-based legislation is going to be quite complex and it's going to be multi-sectoral in how it's going to address some of these disputes. And it's not going to be as easy as assigning provincial health cards or status cards, because what about the people who are coming out of the foster care system? whom have just found out that they're Indigenous? What about all the people whom are under Bill S3 and they are going to be put onto their, you know, the to the ban registry for that First Nation? Or how are they going to become part of the uh, Inuit land claim, or the, the land comprehensive claim people? Will they be able to do that? So we have to be able to look at all those. And like Kimberly said, we have to be able to have that consultation and that conversation with our respective partners at First Nations, Métis and Inuit levels. Thank you. Thanks, Mary Lee. So we'll go to uh, call to action number 21. Um, so uh, it's about providing sustainable funding for existing and new Aboriginal healing centers to address holistic health needs. Um, and our question to the audience um, as we're discussing this one is really how you can support existing and new um, healing centers. But I will give this one or hand it over to Mary Lee to maybe comment. Um, the question for you guys are what are some examples of funding and what is an Aboriginal healing center and why is it so important? Thanks, Lanelli. Uh, so in this particular one, and it's funny because this is the one that we kind of uh, put there to to align itself with the the, the cooking oil or the, the lard or whatever it is that we're going to use to put together some of our ingredients at this time. And how we're going to be able to do that is being able to look at what is the pot, you know, we have to start looking at some um, some data or some research on based on population health and how we're going to be able to, to um, provide the equipment, the resources, the networks, whatever the healing centers need. Now, a healing center is not some, um, you know, magical kingdom, you come in, you've got to go under this sage and blah, blah, blah. I don't know what kind of, I don't know what people are envisioning or the, what the image is when they think of a healing center. A healing center is very similar to what you might see in your downtown or your rural urban um, health access center. But it's going to have nuances that are going to resonate with the Indigenous people whom you are providing services, treatments, or programs for. So that way it shows that cultural safety or that cultural confidence in being able to provide the, the, the services that are specific to the needs of the people in your area. If you are working in BC, what you are providing for services or or for the health access centers is not going to be what is going to be required in the Mi'kmaq territory for Nova Scotia and New Brunswick area. It's not going to be what's needed in Northern Saskatchewan or Alberta, but it's going to resonate with how the, the system or the leadership has designated some of their priorities. Um, now, when looking at the sustainable funding issue, that will also come into play when we're looking at distinctions-based legislation, because then we have to look at all of those elements, the four directions, and we have to look at how we're going to deal with the physical, the psychological, the emotional, the mental uh, of that individual, and how, and how they are going to um, uh, you know, benefit from their access to this health access center. Um, and not every community has a healing or a health access center. You might not have access to a doctor for two to three to maybe four months. You might not even have a full onslaught of a health care um, support team. So we have to look at how we're going to develop some of those situations as we're looking at the sustainability of, uh, of funding for Indigenous health access centers. Thank you. Thanks, Mary Lee. There's a comment um, in the chat, which is interesting, and um, I'll maybe get K Kimberly to reflect on what you said, Mary Lee, but also um, potentially answer the question. But someone wrote a paper about abolishing the Indian Act because of all of the challenges that it's presented and proposing instead that um, the federal government move towards like the transfer of services directly to First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples. 
And um, they, they're, the caveat is that they're simplifying the suggestion to keep it short, but what do the panelists think about developing a new federal policy that supports transferring health services and funding to the people? You want me to start, Ellie? Uh, maybe Kimberly. Oh, no, you want me? Kimberly? <laughs> I don't Kimberly? know. You guys, you guys decide amongst yourselves. I flipped the coin, Kimberly. <laughs> Well, you know, I, it, on the fly, I don't know, like it's a very complex um, suggestion. And part of the reason where I think I end up struggling with, you know, whether or not it's a transfer of services, <clears throat> I think what we're really talking about, and um, I, I know this, it's going to sound um, maybe not like I'm addressing the question, but I just, I think that what we're doing is sort of debating the issue in language that policymakers and funders kind of understand. And when I think about it, what I'm really thinking about is relationship building and trust. And so, you know, whether or not it is, um, uh, you know, a transfer of services or whether or not we're talking about sustainable funding um, I think the idea of healing centers, um, <clears throat> and again, it's just the language that we're using, is really about how do you commit to, um, you know, as healthcare providers, as systems that provide care to people, commit to understanding a perspective and building trust um, after everything that's happened. And it, you know, it's one thing, and I think when we look at all of these calls to action, like there are lots of ways to measure success and there's lots of ways to think about how you make it better. But ultimately it's about trying to understand what the need is and then entering into a trusting and lasting relationship where you agree to address that need. Um, and all of the challenges that go with it. And I think even when we talk about reconciliation, in my mind, it's not a destination so much as it is a commitment to a process, a process of being in relationship together, you know, of setting the goals together, of working through the issues of what does this look like in terms of care? What does it look like in terms of funding? And, you know, to be frank, I think part of the issue is that we, um, actually don't get into these conversations as much as we can or should because we're afraid that we won't be able to meet the need or we're afraid that we won't be able to address um, the disparity without even really understanding um, you know what that is and so I think um, what it takes is some real conversations about what is it that we're talking about when we say healing center, you know, like going down that road that Marilee has kind of um, touched on. And what is it um, when we talk about addressing uh, mental, emotional, and spiritual harms and not worrying about whether or not, you know, um, we'll ever be able to accomplish that, but entering into the relationship and the discussion and feeling a sense of responsibility. And I think those are the first steps. Um, mm -hmm. And I know that's not, you know, that's not in the language, again, that policymakers and funders sort of understand the need, but that is, I think, where we need to start. Mm -hmm. I think like the wording of sustainable funding, it really limits it to just the financial aspect and not that relationship-based um, commitment uh, that's really required. I was gonna add just in terms of um, Aboriginal healing centers, like there's plenty of examples across Canada and even in the US, I was thinking of the South Central Foundation NUCA model um, as one example of um, kind of that collaborative piece. There's also the LumaCare Clinic in BC. Um, so I know there's a lot of examples across Canada that, you know, our audience can leverage as well in terms of learning about what these are, how they've been put together and um, how they're, they're working together with the rest of the system, because there is a comment um, by the audience that, you know, the system, whether it be an indigenous led health system is not separate from the rest of the system. They still have to be working together. So 
Um, I think my main takeaway from this one is really more that like relationship based collaborative approach um, to doing all this work. So we'll move on to the next call to action number 22. Um, which is about recognizing the value of Aboriginal healing practices um, and using them in the treatment of Aboriginal patients in collaboration with Aboriginal healers, elders, uh, where requested uh, by um, Aboriginal patients. So again, we're going to uh, look to hear from you guys about um, how these um, Aboriginal healers are being integrated into your organizations um, or how they're being supported. But I'm going to turn it to Mary Lee to answer the, a question about what organizations and governments or associations different groups can do to recognize the value of Aboriginal uh, healing practices and use them in the treatment of Aboriginal patients or clients. Thank you, Ellie. So this is going to follow what could be <clears throat> the path of how you're putting together some of the ingredients from your pantry. And finally, we're starting to see some sort of a substance. I mean, the previous, you know, was the oil. And if you're missing some policies, well, then your product won't stick together. So then how are you going to put together healthcare systems if you don't have the proper products to put into it? When we look at this particular area, we also have to work with a very traditional, um, a, a, a traditional elders, knowledge keepers approach. And that is something in this particular uh, uh, call is sensitive. Not everyone is a healer. Not everyone is a knowledge keeper and not everyone is an elder. Just because you got old, you have gray hair does not mean that you are an, a recognized elder. If you're unsure, contact the lead organizations whom are, you know, uh, the experts in Indigenous health, like Sina, to saying, how do I determine? Who do I ask? Where do I obtain the proper information so that I don't make a mistake. Because there are, out, there are those so-called elders that are out there that are jeopardizing the safety and well-being of our people because they're self-appointing. And we bring them into these treatment centers and we bring them into these programs and it causes much more damage than we need to. So working with the organizations whom have methodologies or they have best practices or they have indicators that allow them to gauge that qualification. Now, it may not be written down. We, for the most part as Indigenous people, are a very oral history-driven uh, entity. We have things that cannot be recorded. We have things that cannot be written down. They have been passed on by generation by generation. And I hope that they will continue in that method. But when we're talking about some of the, to recognize the value of some of these practices, because we know that, and just let me bring it down to a simple practice. If you have to remove someone from their community to come to the city for, let's say dialysis treatment, or chemotherapy treatment. And you want them to be able to have the maximum output from that treatment possible. You put them into the hospital setting. First of all, who's going to interpret for them? How are they going to get this? How are they going to feel comfortable? They're, they're angst. They're going to be so scared and, and suspicious of what's going on around them. And then they're going to be given food that they've never seen before, or they've never really had before or don't really care for. So some of the simpler practices that we're seeing is where traditional country food is being brought into the hospital care setting. It's being brought in so that people can absorb the medications required as part of their treatment plan. So that way they can get the, 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 the highest impact of their treatment system. That's just one of the more simpler ideas. But 
you know, the other side is in order to having somewhere where they can, um, uh, they can feel comfortable within their environment. We know that a lot of the health science centers are, are putting forward um, uh, a, a, a smudging place, a, um, a, a ceremonial place where some of these people practice this on a daily basis and it's part of their well-being. And we know that in some of the regions across the country, there are elder councils. Now you can't, you know, you can't, can't Google them, can't call 911, what's the elder council? But you can contact the lead organizations within your region to finding out whom are the bona fide knowledge keepers and elders within your environment. Thanks. Thanks, Mary Lee. Kimberly, did you want to comment on any of this? Um, I'll just say really quickly, uh, you know, Mary Lee has pointed out a very important thing. If you, you know, aren't familiar or you don't feel like um, you know who the people are in your, and again, these are like very place-based um, and the knowledge is always specific to different groups or different areas of the country. But if, you know, if you're not somebody who knows or has relationship with organizations that know, that would be the first step to me is to really develop those relationships like organizations like SENA or um, Indigenous organizations that are reclaiming and revitalizing this tradition of elders and knowledge keepers and have a really strong base in that area. Those are the people you need to talk to. And again, recognizing that, um, you know, like a lot of it is, um, it can't just be something that you just reach out when there's a need. There has to be a cultivated relationship. There has to be ongoing conversation. Those organizations also need to understand what you need in your um, healthcare system or your organization to support in order to find the right individuals and the right group of people to um, work with you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think to that point, um, one of the things that we talk about in the cultural safety and humility standard, which um, will hopefully be for public review shortly, is, um, you know, it's one thing to have policies around that, but how do you train the non-Indigenous healthcare workers, um, as well as the elders or whoever um, those healers are, to really be integrated together and to be working together on the team. So everyone needs to feel like they're part of that care team um, and what are the mechanisms to compensate uh, elders coming into the system? So you, it's a whole infrastructure around um, including and in identifying, including integrating um, these types of practices into the healthcare system. So um, that's one of the things, uh, you know, just in terms of the preparation that needs to go into it, the thinking, and with all that is the collaboration with these individuals or with these communities to, um, identify what those mechanisms are and what's needed in terms of support. Before you go on, Ali, uh, I just I just know that there's a there's a question out there, and I I, I see that someone Danica has uh, already kind of replied. Sina is the Canadian Indigenous Nurses Association, to which I am the chief executive officer. It is in its 47th year of operation. I haven't been there 47 years. <laughs> but it is the longest indigenous health organization in the country. We are the voice for First Nations, Inuit and Métis nurses in Canada. Thank you, Ellie. Thanks. So we'll go to call to action number 23, um, which can come off as almost being one of the more practical, practical calls to action when we um, read the other ones that may be more like policy oriented or funding oriented, which a lot of healthcare organizations don't have necessarily direct control over, but um, calling upon or uh, government to increase the number of Aboriginal professionals working in healthcare fields. So whether that be physicians, nurses, or, or whatever type of pro providers. Um, ensuring their retention and also providing cultural competency or cultural safety and humility training for uh, all healthcare providers working within the system. So maybe I'll ask Mary Lee to kind of um, talk about this one first. 
in terms of what organizations can do to support indigenous um, workforce. Thank you, Ellie. So this is a very important one here because it also relates to some of the other calls to action under the 94 calls to action. And it also relates to some of the discussion that has come from the audience members as part of this webinar. And that is looking at the uh, health human resource needs. Right now, we do not have a very good representation of the numbers that are required for Indigenous healthcare professionals in this country. We do not have an idea of the workforce participation analysis, so some of our projectional needs. We do not have a good number on the academic institutions to facilitate some of the Indigenous content when we start modifying content under the faculties of nursing or medicine. When we're looking at this particular call to action, it is probably one of the larger webs and will take a long time for us to deal with it. Kind of like when you're brewing tea. You can't leave it there forever and let it stay. You have to look at retention and recruitment in the sense of let's keep what we got and let's gather something new. But how can you gather something new when you don't know how much you wanna gather of it. We have poor quantitative data in order to facilitate some of the workforce analysis in this country. And, and I'm speaking in regards to the nursing lens. In the occupational coding in Canada for nurse, it is one four digit combination, 3112 nurse. Yet, if you click on that nurse classification coding, it unfolds to 121 different occupations in the nursing environment. Now let's spread that out across the country for every province. How many do I need in each of these 121 just for Main Street? If I can identify that, am I able to identify the Indigenous requirement? Highly unlikely. If I can't identify that, how am I going to be able to facilitate the need for cultural competency training? How are we going to measure it? How are we going to track it in all health professions? When we look at this particular issue too, we also want to take a look at it under the lens of healthcare uh, careers for the secondary level, because we want to be able to provide to secondary level students the information necessary to facilitate their academic development. So that by the time when they're finished their high school years, that they have the required programs for them to enter whatever health sciences program that they have determined they wanna get into. When we look at the development of uh, cultural competency, we're looking at it from two avenues. The first being in the undergraduate stream, so the basic knowledge, some of which you are learning under these webinars, and then there will be an advanced knowledge. So that will be into the graduate programs. The, that level will also look at the transfer of responsibility. It will look at, it will look at some of how you're going to complement your professional training as part of your cultural competence. We are looking forward to working with the nurse lead organizations across the country to address their position statements and how they're going to be able to um, discuss cultural competency as part of that health profession. Thanks, Ellen. Thanks, Mary Lee. Kimberly, um, I don't know if you want to comment. I do recall when we were talking about this call to action in our preparation, you were talking about it being beyond human resource practices in terms of that recruitment and retention and how to support um, Indigenous workforce. Yeah, yeah, and I think again, if you just want to have like a very basic, um, you know, policies in place and, you know, an affirmative action policy, those types of things, um, that is really, in my opinion, like, you know, 10, 20 years ago, that might've worked, but now, I mean, really, uh, what I know about an indigenous, like being an indigenous nurse, for example, and being in that environment is that there's a lot more interaction that happens. It's not just about having the numbers there, 
Um, but it's about how do you support Indigenous people then to practice in a way that is, um, uh, you know, um, not even comfortable, but I guess, uh, you know, like it's a genuine uh, way. Like, how do you allow Indigenous people to be who they are in the system? And, um, you know, I really like um, Marilee's reference to the fact that there are different levels of this. And I think that's an important piece too, as a manager or as a leader in healthcare is to recognize that there are different levels of competency and whether or not we're talking about, you know, Indigenous professionals working in the healthcare field or non-Indigenous people who need cultural competency training, or, um, you know, I guess in my mind, um, even as an Indigenous person, you know, I worked through different levels and developed a practice over years and years. So there's an amount of knowledge that you come out of nursing school with, but your practice develops in so many ways. And if, I was feeling supported in the system, my indigeneity would become part of that practice. Um, I would be, you know, able to draw on who I am and my identity as an Indigenous person and um, bring that into my practice. And I think that's what's really, you know, missing in terms of the system or being supported to do that. Um, in fact, you know, when you go to school, it's the opposite, you know, you're really, um, there is a path already set for all nurses and doctors and you know the idea of expressing an identity through your practice isn't one that's um you know talked about openly and i think maybe there is a place to start as well is um for all of us to feel comfortable to reflect and include uh, more of our you know individual um um, elements into uh, the development of a practice and then find ways in the system to support that and reinforce it. I mean, when we talk about retention, you know, as a manager, how do I support everybody to bring who they are to work, you know, and then how do I reinforce that that's valuable? Um, so that's where I would say. Yeah. Ali, if I, I could join in there, <clears throat> just before we go to the next uh, or the last call to action. The one thing that I want to encourage people to remember here is that cultural competency is one, ax one aspect of a measurable indicator in um, assessing your knowledge of Indigenous ways of knowing. Sounds like a handful, and it is. But at the same time, it's not for Indigenous people. We want to make sure that non-Indigenous partners in the healthcare professions are also uh, eligible or also privileged to become part of the Indigenous content in learning about Indigenous health, Indigenous ways, Indigenous ceremony, Indigenous culture, Indigenous language. And I could go on and on and on as you can probably tell. But at the same time, I want to make sure that when we're changing those curriculums in each of these types of programs, or especially in the nursing lens, that we are also providing that information to our non-Indigenous allies. Because at some point in your professional career, you are going to work with, even if it's policy, if it's in the healthcare as a frontline worker, if it's in a health access center, you are going to work with an Indigenous person. So let's give you the information that you need to make sure that you, you're comfortable in the environment that you're in. The other one that I want to make sure that you're aware of here is cultural safety and humility. And cultural safety and humility is very similar to what you might know as Maslow's hierarchy of needs. We start off at the beginning of the spectrum and at the end of that spectrum is cultural safety and humility. And some of you might say, why end humility? It is what is important to bring that forward from the physician's lens because humility is part of what grounds us in our respective positions, whether we're a policymaker, a legislation, a regulatory body, a, whatever type of organization are, because you have to be comfortable at some point in saying, I'm humble. I want to learn from you. 
I do not know. I made a mistake. I was ignorant and I did not know. That is part of your humility training. Being able to take yourself out of that comfort situation saying, oh, I didn't know that you're supposed to do it a smudge. I didn't know that's what you're supposed to do at sweat. I didn't know what that, that necklace meant to that person or what this meant or that meant. It's part of your humility training so that you can bring that and integrate that as part of your professional scope of practice. Thank you. Thanks, Mary Lee. I think um, a lot of what you talked about segues well into call to action number 24, which is really about, um, if we could go to the next slide, which is really about um, calling on medical schools and nursing schools to require students to learn about um, Indigenous health, um, to do conflict resolution, um, and to uh, complete some cultural safety training. Um, so I maybe ask Kimberly to um, answer the questions in terms of um, what are some learnings or what are some experiences that you've seen in terms of nursing schools taking initiatives or what some of these practices you've seen? Mm -hmm. Um, I think, you know, this is a, a really important piece and even just building off the last discussion. Um, when people are in a learning mode, I think that is the time to start introducing, um, uh, you know, other ways of looking at how the skills um, and the, all these interactions occur. Um, I think one of the things that um, was interesting to me as an Indigenous person and going through these trainings in a time where um, reconciliation is on the table is that it's not always obvious to me either, you know, what's at play. Um, and um, it can be a really hard thing to um, participate in some of those discussions and to participate in a way that's constructive. And so I really just want to encourage people like not only to start thinking about how do we include these teachings and discussions about Aboriginal rights into um, uh, medical schools and nursing schools, but to remember that that takes a lot of um, emotional and mental energy for everybody you know, involved in those discussions and that you, sh you have to, you know, make the commitment with enough time and with the right resources to support people to have those conversations and to incorporate what they're learning in a constructive way. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so it's, it goes beyond just sort of including these concepts in a curriculum. Um, but like everything else, what it means is that there is a commitment um, to see the process through because it is challenging. I think there has to be an understanding that it does and it may take more resources um, in um, certainly in the time where you're changing, um, you know, teaching practices and, and um, changing curriculum. And I think um, it's really, it calls upon all of us to, uh, you know, indigenous people as well um, to take the time to reflect on what is it that I'm struggling with uh, in this learning or this teaching, you know, and that is a big part as Indigenous people that elders um, help us a lot with is, uh, you know, when we're struggling with content or we think we're struggling with an issue, there needs to be this reflective practice. And what is it that I'm really coming up against? And a lot of times those are personal things or those are things that we've struggled with in the past. And um, to me, um, uh, that's a big you know, piece of this call to action is really around, um, again, making a commitment to reconciliation as a process, an ongoing process and um, taking the time as individuals to um, reflect on those teachings. Thank you. And I think I would argue that probably a lot of our audience are, whether they're physicians or nurses or whoever, uh, MHA are teaching in a lot of these institutions and have a voice um, within these institutions where even this webinar could be shared or they can change their curriculum as a starting point. 
Um, but I will pass it over to Mary Lee being the Sina lady um, mm -hmm. to talk about uh, um, where the schools are at and what can be done. Thanks, Ali. Thanks, Kimberly. Uh, so I just wanted to be cognizant of the time here and just in very short, what we're addressing here is we've we've made a collaborative collaboration with the Canadian Association of Schools of Nursing, which represents the 96 schools of nursing across the country. And what they have done is they have made a public statement in a commitment to addressing how the nursing schools are going to look at Indigenous content as part of the nursing um, <clears throat> as part of the nursing academic program <clears throat> courses. So when also doing that, we know that there's differing levels. We have some champions, we have some intermediate and we have some beginners. And it's not to say that one is any less than the other. It's just to say that the champions have had a little bit longer in learning what it is that they needed to do and have made a lot of mistakes along the way. The ones in the intermediate have learned from the mistakes that champions have made and are trying to correct it. And the beginners, are coming out of the gate right now because they wanna be part of that commitment. They said, yes, our nursing program needs to reflect indigenous content for indigenous people. And those beginners are going to learn the lessons and the humility from all of their intermediate and champion colleagues. But in doing so, what's happening with it? Is there a report card that's being done? Is how are we gonna measure it? How are we gonna show it? And just let me say that, yes, with the Canadian Indigenous Nurses Association and COSIN, we are getting together to develop that report card to showcase to the federal government and the provincial and territorial governments that here is how the schools of nursing are addressing the courses and dealing with Indigenous health issues within their undergraduate and graduate programs and how they are looking at addressing these, not just for the short term, but for the long term and how they're going to help Indigenous health organizations like SENA in being able to address some of these issues as we move forward down the seven generations path. Thank you everyone for that. Thanks guys. So we are at the last minute of our webinar. So we're gonna take a quick, maybe 20 seconds each to talk about maybe a, a main takeaway from this session that you would like the audience to, um, to carry with them. So Kimberly, we'll start with you. Sure, I just want to um, acknowledge everybody's active participation in the discussion. It's been really great to read through the chat and to see your reactions to the, to the panel, but also to see all of the resources that you know about out there. And to me, um, that is a huge success in terms of this discussion. And I really, really look forward to engaging more uh, either offline or in future discussions. Thanks. Mary Lee? How am I going to do this in 20 seconds? <laughs> uh, so just, <laughs> yeah, so base, oh, basically what I'd like to say is look within your organization. How are you introducing cultural safety within your organization? Are you meeting the commitment and are you prepared to accept the challenges that are laid before you? I want to thank everyone for taking the opportunity. I want to thank the ancestors for have brought, bringing us here today. And thank you for your time. Jimmy Gwetch to everyone. Thank you, Kimberly. Any any closing? No. Well, so we were not going to say goodbye because we don't say goodbye. We'll say see you later. But thanks everyone for joining today. And uh, the recording of the session will be available shortly after um, on the CCHL and HSO websites. And we'll also be sharing some resources compiled from uh, the chat um, after the fact. So stay tuned for those things. And Merry Christmas to everyone. <laughs> Bye.